Well, thank you all for coming today. Continue to eat, and uh, there's a coffee and cookies uh, over in the corner there, so uh, have at it. Um, my name is Tom Benson, and I want to welcome you all and thank you all for coming to the 2018 Art and Culture Awards Lunch. Uh, before we get going, I wanted to uh, thank a few people. Uh, first of all, thanks to the Doubletree Hotel, manager Dan Monahan and Jessica Northam and staff, and the new carpet and the new chandeliers. What do you think of that? that? Thank you very much to the Doubletree. <laughs> thanks also to uh, our two major sponsors for today's event, uh, Logjam Presents and First Security Bank. I want to thank all of them. We have a number of local officials and uh, um, uh, some national recognition today. Um, I wanted to uh, say hello to uh, and thank Senator John Tester and uh, Deborah Franson is representing <laughs> Senator John Tester. Uh, I believe Sue Malik might be here as well from the state legislature. Is Sue here? Maybe she hasn't made it yet. Um, Dave Strohmeyer and Gene Curtis from Missoula County Commissioner's Office. I believe Jesse Ramos from City Council is here as well. Jesse, are you here? Yeah, all right. Thank you, Jesse. Cinda Holt from the Montana Arts Council. And I want to thank and just quickly introduce the uh, members of the Arts Missoula Board. Um, Katie Patton, our president. Katie. I'll read them all off and then we can hold the applause until the end. How's that? Heidi Sterrett, Laura Bovard, Mickey Fredrickson, Greg Boris, John Combs, Gwen Lanquist, Robin Chakota, Jeremy Canwell, Scott Woodall and Jake Krylick. Thanks to all of the Arts Missoula Board. They work hard all year long on various committees. And if you're interested uh, in seeing what the board does, you can chat with any one of them or me after the, after the uh, lunch today. Um, also want to thank Advanced Litho for donating the printing of your program. Thank you to Advanced Litho. Thanks to Jonathan Qualbin, as always, for our, as our photographer. And Jasmine Raymond with the clay studio. All the, the centerpiece clay pots uh, are made by local artists at the clay studio. And they're all available for sale, by the way. And 100% uh, of the sale, if you're interested, will go directly to the artists. So um, we're not getting any of that. And neither is the clay studio. The artists will get it. Thank you very much, Jasmine. <laughs> and thanks again to... Uh, Missoula Community Access Television for filming this. This will be uh, as part of their program at some future date. I want to also uh, thank the Arts Missoula staff. I mean, you saw them when, you, when we came in. Our program director, Matt Anglin, and our public art coordinator, Becca McCarran, and our director of SPARK is Jacqueline Snow. Thanks to all of you. Oh. Well, this is the time uh, when I usually um, give a little of a, the year in review, uh, talk about what, what's been happening at Arts Missoula for the past year and what we can expect for the future. It's been a uh, busy and good life at Arts Missoula, but before, uh, before we get into what's happening in Arts Missoula, I want to talk a little bit about the arts in Missoula, uh, look at the big picture. There is a... Uh, this is, I'm holding up, and it's on the screen, uh, the Montana Business Quarterly, which is put out by the University of Montana Bureau of Business and Economic Research. And the most recent article, the most recent issue, has an article in it called Arts Equal Big Business. Um, it's obviously, we didn't get the cover story, but that's okay. We're in, the, we're in there, um, and the Arts Equal Big Business, and it's a focus on the nonprofit arts uh, in Missoula, of which uh, it provides 1,913 full-time equivalent jobs, 4.4 million in state and local revenue, 
and audiences at arts events spend $33 million on things not related to the art per se, like gas and lodging and food. Um, so it's, the arts are uh, not just fun and fun to go to, they obviously provide big economic stimulus in Missoula. And the big number is that all together, if you take the audiences and the organizations, it is a $54 million um, economic impact, which is three times the size of cities our size. Wow. So that's a pretty bold statement, and in trying to make sure that we provide real news, you might be wondering, where does that come from? So it comes from Americans for the Arts publishes uh, every five years a, a work called Arts and Economic Prosperity, which is a study of nonprofit arts and or, uh, audiences and organizations across the country. It, uh, they survey 340 different study groups, cities, towns, regions, 340 Missoula being one of them, in every state in the country, focusing on jobs, tourism, which is a, a, the second largest industry in Montana, very important to us. There's lots to digest in that, um, but all you need to know is the number that they gave us, that Missoula's $54 million figure, three times the size of cities our size. So this is something we've always kind of known, that Missoula is an arts-rich community, uh, but now we have some recent numbers to, to go along with that. Another indication of the importance of the arts in our community is something called arts vibrancy, which is a calculation based on the number of artists, organizations, audiences, venues, donors, and overall community support. It's all kind of thrown into a blender and they come out with this arts vibrancy index. Um, this study also includes for-profit as well as non-profit arts. So that means individual artists and private galleries and um, the entertainment industry. So the National Center for Arts Research at Southern Methodist University in Texas has begun publishing annual arts vibrancy reports and Missoula ranks fourth in the nation in mid-sized city. How about that? So two studies came out this past year, both showing national recognition, economic strength, and vibrancy. And what's making us vibrant right now? Well, here's one reason. <laughs> Kettle House Amphitheater opened a year ago and is getting ready for its second full season. And to paraphrase Governor Steve Bullock at the opening of this venue, he said that this place offers three things we love about Montana and it's all very important to the economy. That is beautiful landscape, local craft beer, and the performing arts. That's a quote from our governor. Here's another reason why we're vibrant. Right across town there's another beautiful setting, more local beer, and more great performing artists. The Missoulian reported that at last year's Traveler, Traveler's Rest Festival saw 5,000 attendants each day, roughly half of them coming from somewhere else. That's good for tourism. So the entertainment sector is growing. I, I, you know, it, it, I didn't really realize it until I started looking at it. You know, right now we have five distinct venues in this town that seat at least 4,000 people. Kettle House, Big Sky Brewing, Ogren Park at Allegiance Field, the Adams Center, and Washington Grizzly Stadium. And in the next few months, you'll see all of these folks there. That's in case you need a refresher in the upper uh, right is Keith Urban going clockwise, Cheryl Crow, Steely Dan, Colin Malloy of the Decemberists, Trombone Shorty, and Pearl Jam. They'll all be coming here at one of those five venues. So between the overall economic statistics and the rapid growth, of national touring acts combined with our homegrown organizations and artists, Missoula is clearly well on the way to being part of the national stage. So now let's talk about what goes on in Arts Missoula on a nine to five basis. We're completing our fourth year of Spark with Jacqueline Snow as the director. This is the Kennedy Center Any Given Child initiative to ensure equity and access and arts education in our schools. We're one of 25 any given child communities, and one of nine chosen by the Kennedy Center and Wolf Brown Associates to explore the direct impact of this program to the students, and they'll be coming out to visit and take those statistics uh, in May. 
Spark is clearly the most successful arts collaboration I've seen in Missoula, a project that includes the city of Missoula, uh, MCPS, the UM College of Visual and Performing Arts, organizations, artists, the media, philanthropy, all pushing this initiative forward, and it's housed at Arts Missoula. It involves three things, art for art's sake, which is an, uh, a, a determination to get more art teachers in our schools, art enhancement, getting, getting kids out to see and, and experience more art um, experiences directly in its many forms, and arts integration, which is using art to teach other subjects, math, science, um, so and we love acronyms, so we take STEM and we take A for arts and shove it in the middle there and we get STEAM. So that's what everybody's talking about in arts education. We, every K through 8 student at MCPS has benefited from a, an arts residency in the past year. We're leading the way to move this initiative beyond K-8 and into 9-12. No other, uh, that, that's not part of the original Kennedy Center initiative, but we're taking the initiative to move this even forward. Our second Spark Showcase is on first Friday, May 4th at the Wilma Theater. You can come, come there during first Friday and see more about Spark. And we're planning our first ever statewide arts integration conference at the University of Montana at the end of June. So there's a lot going on with Spark. I mentioned that Spark is an example of collaboration and we're all about collaboration at Arts Missoula. We collaborate with the city of Missoula uh, to uh, administer the Public Art Committee with staff member Becca McCarran as the Public Art Administrator for this Citizen Volunteer Committee that runs the Percent for Art program. Also the traffic signal boxes and all things public art related. Uh, First Night Missoula is a collaboration of artists, volunteers, donors, businesses to celebrate the arts on New Year's Eve and this coming New Year's Eve will be our silver anniversary, the 25th consecutive First Night Missoula. How about that? And our program director is Matt Anglin, who's in charge of First Night. We work with MissoulaEvents.net to assist with our community calendar to have information related to First Friday, uh, gallery walk each month, and other, and other events. It's, uh, it's also the 25th anniversary of our sister city partnership with Neckargemund, Germany. And a student exchange and delegation visit will occur in that city uh, in June, and then in August they're coming here to coincide with our German Fest celebration. Uh, our other sister city is Palmerston North, New Zealand, and we're approaching a 35 years of a sister city partnership there. We've also started taking on uh, other smaller groups that need a 501c3 umbrella, and so we are fiscal sponsor for the Montana Book Festival, carrying on the tradition set by Humanities Montana with 5,000 attendees and 200 authors and presenters over three days. We're the fiscal sponsor for a new, relatively new event called Honoring Our Missoula Community Powwow that takes place at the fairgrounds in September. The All City Jazz Program that you just heard, they're one of our uh, uh, events that we're, uh, in organizations that we're sponsoring. And Lake Bottom Sound, which is a concert series full of jazz workshops and jam sessions. Naomi Moon Siegel is the director and she's with us today also. And I'm happy to announce today, a new position will happen at Arts Missoula. Responding to the reality that Missoula is quickly becoming Montana's international city, particularly with refugee settlement, as a refugee settlement community, we're going to be begin a new position, Director of Global and Cultural Affairs, which will start this spring. And I want to thank uh, and recognize uh, Mayor Angan and his staff and, and, and thank the City Council for approving the funding earlier this week. So we're expanding even more. We also have a new program called the Arts Missoula Star. It's, uh, it's a program to recognize on a monthly basis some of the unsung heroes in Missoula in our arts community. The volunteers, the donors, people behind the scenes, uh, people you may not think about, um, and some of them are with us today. And I think they're all sitting at the log jam table there. Our Arts Missoula Stars, there you are, thank you. So if you want to know more about Arts Missoula, there is always our website, uh, artsmissoula.org, and you can sign up for our weekly newsletter, which, which uh, Becca uh, puts out every week. It's chock full of good information and interesting articles. And of course, these are all things to celebrate, and it's, it's great to celebrate the arts and to celebrate all of our award winners. We have a great staff, 
a good board of directors and uh, volunteer committees working with all these programs. So I think I'd like to just thank all of you for helping us out. Thank you. But there is always a constant worry. Here you have four national agencies that are really important. Yet, under the cur current political climate, they're constantly threatened. They offer major assistance to regional and statewide agencies, even local organizations, and some of us have benefited from, individually from one of these four organizations. Earlier this month, I went to the uh, UM Odyssey of Stars, and I, and I heard uh, the star recipient, Casey Criley, talk about all of this, and she said, imagine a world without art. I cannot. That was a wonderful statement she made. Um, but there is good news, actually. As of yesterday, Congress uh, passed one other sort of step in the budget um, to not eliminate the NEA and NEH, as the President had suggested, but to keep it going and actually increase it a little bit. So that's good news on that side. But here's the thing. <laughs> the National Endowment for the Arts has a budget of a little over $150 million. There are 243 million adult Americans. Simple math will tell you that means it costs less than a dollar for every American to support the National Endowment for the Arts. In fact, it costs every American 63 cents each to support the National Endowment for the Arts. If you add up the budgets of these four uh, agencies, that comes to a cost per American citizen of $4.50. Roughly the cost of one beer at a local brew pub. <laughs> a year. <laughs> now we know what the arts means to our economy locally. We know that a public investment in the industry gets great return for the community. On a national level, the amount that all government agencies donate to arts, that's federal, state, local, is around $5 billion. But the total amount returning to the, these very agencies in the form of payroll, other taxes, fees, is $27 billion. $5 billion, if you consider that an investment, 27 is the return. That's a 500% return. That's a pretty good return on an investment. So when you hear that these organizations, these agencies that, that prime this pump are often called wasteful, bloated, government overreach, just remember, it costs one beer. <laughs> this is all a way of saying that our national funding, while secure for now, is still pretty iffy. And we must look to support the arts in other ways, to support this vibrant industry and our vibrant community. And with that, I want to invite our board president, Katie Patton, to come up here for a few minutes and talk about a new program at Arts Missoula called the Arts Supporter Program. Katie Patton. Good afternoon, and let me just thank you all for coming today. I'm always so inspired after coming to this luncheon because it's so great to be in a room with so many people that support arts and culture in this community, and I think it's one of the things that makes Missoula such a great place to live. And I would wager that there's not one person in this room that doesn't support the value or believe in the value of arts and culture for our community, but outside of this room, there's gonna be a lot of people who don't yet appreciate that value. And while it's important for each of us to advocate to our state and federal representatives, it's equally important for us to advocate to our local community. I think you might know why I'm up here. <laughs> so in this room, we do recognize the power of arts and education, and that's why Missoula is becoming a leader in arts education through the SPARC program. In this room, we recognize the social benefits of shared cultural experiences, and we celebrate these. We're celebrating right here today. We do it at first night, we do it at first Fridays downtown, we do it at the book festival. We celebrate all the time in Missoula. We recognize the importance of cultural diplomacy by celebrating our sister cities with German Fest and New Zealand Day. 
And we recognize that public art improves our visual landscape and makes our town uniquely Missoula. We recognize the economic impact of the arts in our local economy, and clearly with Tom's comments about tax revenue, it's definitely an investment in the arts and culture is definitely uh, a revenue in uh, something that government should appreciate a little more than it does sometimes. So we recognize these things, but we recognize them because those of us in this room are the choir, and we need to expand who's in our choir. And to do that, we need to advocate. And to advocate, we have to do some kind of unglamorous things. We gotta have a person who's sitting at a desk with a computer and electricity. There's really unglamorous things like paper clips and staples and postage stamps. But all of these things are what's necessary for our really excellent staff to be able to advocate for the arts in our local community. And we can't take funding for granted, so it's something that we have to stay on top of all the time. So on behalf of the board, uh, the Arts Missoula Board, I have a very simple request. You all know what it's gonna be. We are officially kicking off our supporter campaign today, and you will find the literature and envelopes on your tables for a reason. Arts Missoula has a very dedicated staff and they have a vision. So please support our advocacy efforts in the Missoula community by contributing to this campaign. You can take the envelopes home. You can leave them outside at the desk if you want. You can think about it. You can not think about it. But please consider supporting our advocacy efforts and you can be our heroes. Whoops. So I'm gonna thank you in advance for your contributions. And then now we get to get on to the more exciting element of today's luncheon, and that is honoring this incredible roster of local recipients. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. The tradition of honoring citizens at this luncheon began in 1999 with the Cultural Achievement Award as a way to honor individuals whose outstanding work in the arts and humanities have made significant contributions to this community's quality of life. In 2003, we began to recognize local businesses with the business support for the arts. In 2010, we expanded our awards program to include artistic programming and cultural visionaries. And a year later, we added awards for individual artists and arts educator. Nominations are open to the public, and awardees are chosen by a vote of the Arts Missoula Board of Directors. A list of the awardees is on the back of your program and includes visual artists, music, musicians, dancers, writers, actors, administrators, benefactors, community leaders. It's a long list. Some of the folks are with us today at lunch. So, so I don't like name you all and then forget somebody and that would be very embarrassing. Why don't I just ask it, all of you who have ever won one of these awards if you'd please stand up right now. Well, you can see it's a great list. And today we're gonna add Five more to that list. Ah, here we go. <laughs> for cultural achievement. This year we honor Sharon Snavely for her lifetime of dedication and service to several of Missoula's nonprofit arts organizations. She was nominated jointly by John Driscoll, Executive Director of the Missoula Symphony, and Stephen Kahn, Dean of the College of Visual and Performing Arts at the university. Sharon moved to Missoula in the early 1970s with her family, where she and her husband Don raised six children. And as will become apparent, children are a big theme in her life and in her work with local arts groups. One of their children was in the first ever production of the Missoula Children's Theater in the old Front Street Theater, where the, where the trailhead is now. During that time, she joined the founding board of MCT. Since then, Sharon has taken leadership roles with many of Missoula's top 
cultural organizations, which are listed here. Missoula Children's Theater, the Art Museum, the Symphony, and the UM College of Visual and Performing Arts. But she hasn't just sat on the board. Sharon gives us all a lesson on what it means to be on a nonprofit board of directors, which is if you agree to sit at that table, you better be prepared to become a leader. And she has been a leader. She has been the president of the Missoula Art Museum Board of Directors, the president of the Art Associates of Missoula, the president of the Missoula Symphony Association, the co-president of the Missoula Symphony Guild. She also served on the Arts Missoula Board of Directors until she got busy with all this other stuff going on. As I mentioned, what she's most proud of are the programs focusing, focusing on children, such as MAM's fifth grade program, the symphony's fourth grade program, and the, and the symphony's Suzuki program. She's worked tirelessly on the Ovando Grand Fondo bike ride for the symphony. She dreamed up and brought to life the symphony soiree, which is now one of Missoula's most elegant gala events. And across the river, she has been a leader there as well as president of the College of Visual and Performing Arts Advisory Council, co-chair of the UM Campaign Steering Committee for the college. In addition, Sharon and John have been financial supporters for the Buddy DeFranco Jazz Festival, the Montana Repertory Theater, and the Odyssey of Stars. But it's not all about the arts. She was a founding board member of Camp Make a Dream. She worked with the Special Olympics during their opening ceremonies when it was here in Missoula. She's also been president of the Missoula Red Cross and the St. Patrick Health Foundation. Again, it's about the children. In Sharon's words, the youth are our future and Missoula is our Camelot. In the words of Stephen Kahn, she has helped facilitate a closer town and gown atmosphere and contributes to UM and Missoula's image as the cultural capital of Montana. Indeed, her footprints are to be found all over Missoula's cultural landscape. And John Driscoll says, she serves with passion, purpose, dedication, and thoughtfulness. Her energy knows no bounds, and her honesty and sense of humor invigorate all those around her. And he finishes by saying, I am in awe of Sharon Snavely. And so are we. Sharon Snavely, come on up. I really don't have too much to say because Tom said it all <laughs> and more. Um, first of all, I want to thank Tom and the Arts Museum. Here I go, Missoula. I haven't had a drop to drink. Um, the Cultural Council and everybody that on the board of directors that voted to give me this award today. I also want to thank the two people that nominated me, Dean Com and John. Driscoll uh, with the symphony and the U of M found, uh, performing arts. I, I was told at a very young age by my grandpa Martin to be humble and grateful. I am humble and grateful today. We moved to Missoula in 1973 from Phoenix. Uh, I had two very young boys then and was taken back by all the art, music, a lot of other things that were offered, ex uh, not only the sports. Don't get me wrong, I like sports, and all the kids played sports. But it was amazing that you could actually have a art lesson in school, play music, music lessons. Um, it was so much that I was so impressed with the community with that. What a wonderful opportunity for our young, ch uh, a young child. I quickly joined the Women's Symphony and the Missoula Arts uh, Associates, and I've made friends that are 40 plus years still going on, so that's one of the treasures. My husband and I raised six kids together in Missoula, not all here at the same time, thank goodness. <laughs> our 51-year-old, Jeff, lives in Portland, and our 
48-year-old Brad lives in Phoenix, and they were the two of the kids that were in one of the first plays at the Missoula Children's Theater. Uh, Sarah, our daughter who lives, who's 43, who lives in Stockholm, Sweden, was one of, at the age of six, was one of the first Suzuki students. She still plays her music and really appreciates what she had in Missoula as far as her educational background in Missoula. Our son Jake, who's 40, also lives in Stockholm and is in the arts and the music entertainment with his talented wife, Rebecca. And Ben, who would be 36, also loved the arts and loved Missoula and loved the ma'am. The ma'am embraced him and loved him and thank you for loving him so much. And uh, the last is uh, Dan, and he's thir uh, 38, and he decided that he likes sports better, so we let one of them go. We do have seven grandchildren, and they all have the exposure to both the sports and the arts. Um, I really, Tom, you, you just covered so much stuff. I'm going to cut this short and just really say that I think one of the biggest uh, things that I felt so much pride in working on, not only the arts, was that we were chosen to be in 15, 16, and 17 the host for the Special Olympics. And I feel that it was such a pleasure for our town to be chosen for that. Um, it's what Missoula does best to honor all of our, not only arts, but our special athletes. And I feel like the luckiest girl in the world to have been in this lovely community, to be a breast cancer survivor four years this summer. Remember, ladies, every 12 months, no exceptions. And I do call this town Camelot. Last but not least, I'd like to thank my husband for his patience, his encouragement, because if it weren't for him, I wouldn't have been able to do this like I have. Thank you for honoring me so much today. The Arts Educator Award was first given out in 2011, honoring an outstanding educator at any age level who has devoted a career to teaching a craft and making a significant impact on this community. This year we honor Raphael Chacon, <laughs> Professor of Art History and Criticism at the University of Montana, nominated by Dean Stephen Kahn. Born in Havana, Cuba, Raphael achieved his undergraduate degree in art at Wabash College and his MA and PhD at the University of Chicago. He joined the faculty of the University of Montana in 1994 and, be and became a full professor in 2005. The diverse range of courses he has taught over the years includes Greek and Roman art, 19th century art, critical theories in the visual arts, introduction to art criticism, contemporary art and criticism, African, Latin, American, excuse me, Latin American, Egyptian, and Spanish art, the art of the ancient Americas, and the art of world civilizations. He's also been a key part of the Creative Pulse program at the University of Montana, where the focus is on arts integration in the classrooms. He's a favorite instructor in the Mali program, offering courses on art and war, the Ottomans, and Cuban art and culture. Rafael has also been part of the School of Music's Vienna program. During three summers, he gave walking tours of Vienna and Eisenstadt, introducing students and Mali members to museums, galleries, palaces, libraries, and sculptured gardens, while lecturing on the history of the Habsburg dynasty and other historical topics, as well as the contemporary Austrian art scene. With, U with UM art history colleague Valerie Hedquist, he co-led a successful tour of Italy and Turkey for 25 students. He has lectured in Austria, Cuba, Czech Republic, France, Germany, Holland, Italy, Portugal, Russian, Russia, Slovakia, and Spain. And when he's home, he, br he brings his latest research to the Missoula community, lecturing on such topics as the architecture of A.J. Gibson, the art of Glacier National Park, or the Montanans in the Great War. And he's been a featured speaker for the Missoula Art Museum, the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, the Community Lecture Series, Humanities Montana, 
and the TEDx talks at the university. Raphael engages in innovative approaches to connecting his students with the material. His Roman art class built a scale model of the ancient Roman capital city. His art of the 20th century class recreates exhibitions of modern art, such as the first Cubist exhibition in the United States or the first pop art show in New York City. His Egyptian art class has held a public procession with costume gods and priestesses and priests carrying offerings and the mummified body of a pharaoh. His Latin American art class co-curated an exhibition on Senator Mike Mansfield in Mexico with the help of the staff of the Mansfield Library. The art of the, 20, of the 19th century class recreates the art form of the tableau vivant, a public spectacle in which master paintings come to life. And I believe here we have Renoir, Van Gogh, and Delacroix. All right. <laughs> now I get to go to Jeopardy. <laughs> According to Dean Stephen Kahn, Raphael has a rare ability to synthesize art history with politics, psychology, literature, and imagination in a way that blends the entire human experience into his lectures. Through his knowledge, his ability to communicate with others, and his enthusiasm for the subject, he's been able to connect art history and criticism with our immediate lives. He leaves us all enthused and excited about learning, which of course is the mark of a great educator. Dr. Raphael Chacon. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, and thank you to the Arts Missoula. You guys are an amazing organization, and we're very, very proud of what you do. Um, I, when, when, when I first got this award, I heard about it. I was, the first word that came into my mind is fraud. You are a fraud. How can you possibly stand up with that list of people who have been honored by this organization and this community? We are truly a remarkable place with a remarkable set of individuals who do amazing work in, uh, in the arts. And so, um, so I'm humbled by this. I'm, I'm really humbled to be in the company of Sharon and, and the other awardees tonight, but also this long lineage of people who have really defended, advocated for, worked on the arts, and taught the young about the value of art in our lives, whatever art form it is. So, um, so this is truly an honor and it's a humbling experience to be up here uh, to receive this, uh, this award. Um, I think of artists as not just heroes, I think of them as the conscience of our culture, the conscience of our society. They not only enlighten us, they uh, explain things to us, they articulate uh, the, the values of what it means to be human in our time, they phrase things in ways that, uh, that aren't easily graspable, uh, they take uh, huge, awful, sometimes uh, foreboding phenomena and distill it and make it accessible to us. And uh, so the artist is really the hero here. It's not the art professor or the art educator or the teacher. It's the, it's the artist who is, in fact, the hero and the person we're celebrating tonight. So, so all of you artists out there and young artists, old artists, uh, you are the ones who deserve this award, not, uh, not I. <laughs> so I, um, um, what I do every day as an art educator is to get up in the morning and to go teach the young. And, and sometimes I, I feel like I learn more from them than I am ever capable of giving in a, in a typical classroom. Uh, what happens to me is I just simply help shape, sculpt, guide, cajole, sometimes extort a <laughs> performance out of a student, uh, but, but always believing that every human being has the capacity to create, and to share and to certainly to express themselves. So I'm just gonna, uh, I'm gonna briefly talk about a little exercise that, uh, that my baby art history class, my introductory art history class, just did uh, this last week. There's a, there's a tribe in West Africa, uh, a Ghanaian tribe by the name of the Baule. And uh, the Baule have this amazing tradition in which um, we, they, they marry, they have families, but, um, but they also have a spirit spouse they will actually be wedded by a shaman to a, an entity uh, who is their spirit spouse. And this spirit spouse accompanies them through life, also accompanies their current families, and then will accompany them in the afterlife as well. 
So in my baby art history class, my introductory art history survey class, we talked about this tribe and talked about these traditions and the sculpting of the spirit spouse and what it means to keep this other presence in your life, in your world. Uh, so if you think it's hard enough having one spouse, try having a spirit spouse. <laughs> but um, cultural appropriation issues aside, uh, we uh, had the class, we had the class actually create their own spirit spouse. And normally in the, in, the, in the tribal context, that spirit spouse is found for you, it's identified for you by a, a, a shaman, uh, a member of the, of the society, and then you are wedded by a shaman. But in this case, we wanted the students to in fact create their own, to think about what it would mean to have this other entity, the spiritual entity, uh, alongside them in this present life. And so what was interesting to me about that project, well, there was a lot that was interesting about that project. In fact, Nickel and Garner, who's one of the, uh, the, uh, the Art, Arts Missoula stars, is actually my uh, student, my uh, graduate assistant, and uh, she helped facilitate this project. And what was really remarkable was like these amazing creative um, uh, demonstrations from these kids. They, the first one, I'll just tell you a, a, a couple of these. The first one brought in her spirit spouse named Lexi, and Lexi was wearing dungarees, jeans, and with two patches. One patch was a hammer and sickle because Lexi's spirit spouse is a communist. And on the other side, two uh, female images or two female symbols linked because Lexi's spirit spouse is a communist and a lesbian. <laughs> okay, that was really interesting and wonderful. The second spirit spouse that came up was um, uh, Lucifer, the one and only. The fallen angel was her spirit spouse. And I thought, oh my goodness, I looked at Nicola and said, oh, this is very, very interesting. But the third spirit spouse was Jack, a cowboy with a huge heart. And then it went on from there. And we had scores of these amazing things. What these spirit spouses were are really re demonstrations of the values, the needs, the desires, the wishes of these students, some of whom have never made art. Some of whom have never, this is the first time in a college setting where they've been asked to make a work of art. And in an art history class, to make a work of art is a little bit transgressive. So anyway, the arts are indeed transgressive, but they're also revelatory, and they talk about who we are as individuals, what our values are, what we want, what our aspirations are. So for me, the people who best deserve this award Yes, the educators need to be nodded, patted on the back every now and then, but it's the artists. So thank you to all of you out there, and uh, I can't wait to hear from the other awardees. Thank you. The individual artist was first awarded in 2011 and is presented to someone who has shown exceptional achievement in either music, visual art, dance, film, theater, or literature. And that's where we are today. This year, we honor James Lee Burke, award-winning and national best-selling author, nominated by Kim Anderson, Director of Programs and Grants at, the, at Humanities Montana. Jim was born in Houston, Texas, and grew up on the Texas-Louisiana Gulf Coast. He attended Southwestern Louisiana Institute and later received his BA in English and an MA from the University of Missouri. Over the years, he's worked for Sinclair Oil Company. He's been a pipeliner, a land surveyor, a newspaper reporter, a college English professor, a Los Angeles social worker, a, cl a clerk for the Louisiana Employment Service, and an instructor in the U.S. Job Corps. And yes, he's also made a living as a writer. He's published 36 novels and two collections of short stories. Here are just some. There are two fictional characters he returns to again and again, Dave Robichaux and Billy Bob Holland. His characters are crime fighters, but they're also fighting their own de personal demons of alcoholism, the loss, often violent, of loved ones, and the haunting memories of their experiences in Vietnam, all the while coping with racism, police corruption, and the general human condition. His novels Black Cherry Blues and Simmer and Rose have both won the prestigious Edgar Award for Best Crime Novel of the Year. He's also been a recipient of a Breadloaf and Guggenheim Fellowship and an NEA grant. How about that? An NEA grant. <laughs> Two of his novels, Heaven's Prisoners and Two for Texas, have been made into major motion pictures, one starring Alec Baldwin and the other Tommy Lee Jones. 
So here's some of his works, and here's some more. <laughs> Couldn't get them all in there, but I tried. His short stories have been published in the Atlantic Monthly, New Stories from the South, Best American Short Stories, The Antioch Review, Southern Review, and The Kenyan Review. His novel, The Lost Get Back Boogie, was rejected 111 times over a period of nine years. But finally, after the Louisiana State University Press took a chance, it was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> a number of his novels have been set in western Montana, including Light of the World, Bitterroot, and In the Moon of Red Ponies. His portrayal of this place as one populated by fiercely independent loners and hardworking men and women, and his descriptions of the natural beauty of the Bitterroot, Missoula, and Swan Valleys has added to his popularity right here at home. Since he no longer tours when his books come out, his annual signings at such places as Fact and Fiction have become legendary. And he has hats and t-shirts, too. <laughs> Jim and his wife Pearl have been longtime supporters of the Montana Book Festival, the Roxy Theater, the Missoula Writing Collaborative, Missoula Medical Aid, and several local independent booksellers. According to the online periodical Bookline, to read a Dave Robichaux novel is to get the distinct sense that, off, that author James Lee Burke has personal experience with every feeling or characteristic portrayed on the pages therein. Be they heartwarming or excruciating, an alcoholic's demon-plagued life, the love and loss of a good woman, friendships that transcend con conventional explanation, and a strong, if not always accurate, moral compass. Robichaux was published earlier this year, and he has quite recently completed the sequel, Ball and Chain, which was to be released, I think, within a year or so. The Denver Post calls him America's best novelist. His books have been reviewed by too many to list here, but all you really need to know are the words that so often appear on the book cover by the New York Times best-selling author. For all these accolades, I've learned that he is a humble man and doesn't give the impression that he's at all famous. And that, of course, makes him all the more worthy of our recognition. James Lee Burke. Thank you for that kind introduction, and I, I'm greatly humbled by uh, this award and uh, your reception uh, th this afternoon. And I'll make this very quick, and I'll tell you an anecdotal story here in the meantime. Uh, my father, I, I want to thank also not just the group that's here this evening or afternoon, but uh, the entire city of Missoula. Th this is not exaggeration. This is the best place I have ever been. And I've been, I've seen a good part of the world. Uh, it's egalitarian, it's alpine, every kind of person here, and it's filled with intelligent people of goodwill. I'm, if I leave here one day, I get homesick. That's a fact. Anyway, uh, I'd, I'd like to be humble, but let me tell you what my father used to say about humility. My father was the most intelligent man I ever knew. And I remember when I was about 15, I said, I, Daddy, I want to be humble about this situation. He said, Son, don't worry about being humble. Humility will find you. <laughs> and I didn't, quite, I didn't quite know what he meant. And I, and I said, um, I don't quite understand. And he said, well, you have to remember, my father had diction and an accent that was, it was angelic. He could read the phone book and turn it into a sonnet. And it's, it, it, and ling linguists call it plantation English. If you ever hear the recorded voice of Robert Pinwarn or William Faulkner, he had that same accent. And he said, well, everything is relative. What does relative mean, Daddy? He said, well, relative means a situation I, I had the other day. And I was driving through East Texas, and I stopped at this little general store. And up on the veranda, there was an elderly man playing checkers with the Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> 
and he swore the story was true. And so my father continued. So I went up on the uh, on the gallery, and I and I said, "Sir, that cocker spaniel's the most intelligent dog I have ever seen." And the elderly man said. I don't think he's so smart. I done beat him three games out of five. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. Thank you. The Business Support for the Arts Awards was first given out in 2004, honors local businesses that have made significant contributions to Missoula's art and cultural organizations. This year, we honor Montana Public Radio, co-nominated by Barbara Thoreau and Steve Glukert. Most of us know the story of Montana Public Radio, originally a college radio station that started in 1965 on 10 watts out of the S School of Journalism at the university, barely reaching beyond campus. Stories of people driving in from out of town and just parking so they could listen to the opera. It's still housed at UM and has for many years now been part of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and NPR. Now it reaches more than half the state with transmitters, translators, and an alphabet soup of local stations. All along, this station has championed the arts locally and nationally with varied programs, interviews, daily calendar of events, and marketing opportunities for local artists. Terry Conrad, the, the longtime program director, once described to me the simple difference between commercial radio and Montana public radio. Format versus programming. Commercial radio focuses on, uh, focuses on demographics, reaching out to a certain age group, an interest, a gender, Therefore, you have classic rock, oldies, country, news and talk, sports, and when you tune in, that's what you listen to all the time. Montana Public Radio has programs. Some they buy from a national distribution network, others produced locally. Thus, you have classical music, jazz, folk, opera, children's programs, news, talk, and yet the talk is conversational, passionate, yet civil, not unlike Krista Tippett the other night at... Uh, at uh, the University of Montana. Shows about food, shows about books, shows about nature, programs. Terry Conrad is retired, though he still produces one show, Jazz Sessions, each week. This afternoon, in fact. William Marcus, Terry's l former student, who then became his boss, has also retired. Ray Eckness is now the director of the Broadcast Media Center, and the mission remains. Montana Public Radio enriches the mind and spirit, inspires a lifetime of learning, and connects communities through access to exceptional programming. And its vision, Montana Public Radio, will, will be the essential and trusted source for information and cultural programs. So what are those programs? Well, you don't get to know often what these people look like because it's radio. <laughs> so here are some of them. Arts and cultural programming includes Front Row Center with program director Michael Marsalek, featuring news and interviews of upcoming performing arts and music events. The Right Question, hosted for many years by Cherie Newman, now hosted by Sarah Aronson, highlights the literary arts. Montana Broadcasting Association award-winning musician Spotlight with John Floridas in conversation with local and visiting musicians, including the likes of B.B. King, Bonnie Raitt, Allison Krauss, and Daryl Jones. Who? <laughs> Daryl Jones. Well, that Daryl Jones. He's the bass player for the Rolling Stones. The Pea Green Boat with Annie Gard features poetry, readings from participants in the Missoula Writing Collaborative, and the Poetry Club, or live music with the Whiz Pops, or Bill Harley, or radio theater with local actors Howard Kingston and Mark Metcalf. But there's more. There's also, they also serve up daily or weekly local programming that give us artistic and cultural diversity, which of course is good for our brain development. Morning Classics, locally programmed classical music every day. 
Free Forms, which follows that. Literally, Free Form, whatever the programmer wishes to play. The Folk Show on Tuesday. What I Like About Jazz on Wednesday, followed by Blues on the Move. The Food Guys with Greg Patton and John Jackson. Home Ground Radio with Brian Kahn from Helena. Reflections West with Lisa Simon and David Moore about Amer writers and scholars of the American's West. Sunday afternoon jazz programming with Joe Corona and indigenous expression with David Sam are just a few of the diverse programming. The daily performing arts calendar and university and community activities help promote the arts events throughout western Montana and both are featured on the website. Radio personalities appear as MCs at community events such as the Montana Book Festival and the Butte Folk Festival. For many years now, MTPR has broadcast the Missoula Symphony's performances. And then there are the visual artists, such as Monty Dolak, Larry Perney, Neil Weigert, Dana McMurray, Bev Glukert, whose works adorn the annual fundraising t-shirts and coffee mugs and the license plate. Bet you never before equated visual arts and radio, did you? Steve Glukert says, I tune into Montana Public Radio on a daily basis, like many Montanans, and I do have my favorite programs. And other programs, not so much. <laughs> but, he says, that is the voice of humanity. Montana Public Radio clearly does what it sets out to do with its mission, enriches the mind and spirit, inspires a lifetime of learning, and connects communities through access to exceptional programming and there isn't a stronger supporter of local and regional arts and culture in all forms. Representing Montana Public Radio today is the program director, Michael Marsalek. Montana Public Radio. Thank you so much for this honor. Uh, for MTPR. You know, Montana Public Radio is your curator of news. You can trust handpicked music from Montana. That's what we talk about each and every day. And I want to thank Barb Thoreau and Steve Glukert for nominating us for this award. And thanks, of course, to uh, Arts Missoula for the great work that's done year round and uh, for recognizing these fabulous individuals every year and especially this year. Some fine company to be in, and we are thrilled to be in this fine company, uh, honored to share the spotlight today with Charlene Campbell Carey, Raphael Chacon, James Lee Burke, of course, and Sharon Snavely. Congratulations to all of you, and uh, thank you. MTPR is grateful to the University of Montana, to President Seth Bodner, and for the university campus home, and the support that we've had for 53 years on the air. There are dozens of staff and volunteers that make the 168 hours a week of programming on public radio possible in our statewide network. And I want to mention a few specifically. We have incredible teams producing news from around Montana, led by our news director, Eric Whitney. Our membership and development staff works really hard to connect with you and your organizations in many ways, thanks to Dave Dennis, Linda Talbot, Ann Hostler, Suzanne Grist, and Ann McDowell. Our engineering team, led by Saxon Holbrook, is legendary in our building and beyond, and manages to keep the 12, the 12 transmitters and translators cooking along and all the equipment working. I've been doing radio at Montana Public Radio for 28 years. I'm just the talent. I don't even know how radio works. <laughs> Do you turn it on and we're there? Thank you, Saxon and his team. Online, too. Thanks to our leader of the Broadcast Media Center, Ray Eckness, and, and I also want to recognize uh, the vision of our former directors, William Marcus and Terry Conrad, both of which couldn't be here today, unfortunately, but uh, we certainly honor them. Our talented producers, some of which you saw there making art and culture programs every week, include, you know, John Floridas and Sarah Aronson, but also behind the scenes, Beth Ann Austin and programmers like Susan Israel, not to mention nearly two dozen music hosts that help with the soundtrack of our lives here in Missoula and in Montana every day. Our children's programming, led by Annie Gard, is for listeners of all ages and has many fa fans. Identify yourself publicly now as a Pea Green Boat listener. <laughs> I'd like Annie to stand up briefly. <laughs> and we noticed whose hands went up, so we're going to keep track of that. 
The Arts of Missoula is all about partnerships. We are thrilled to partner with you and your organizations to celebrate and to showcase all the events, the openings, the concerts that make life in Missoula so amazing. I echo how fabulous it is to live in this place in this time. It's fantastic. It's actually part of our vision, uh, part of our mission statement to craft authentic moments of beauty, originality, and fun, and to celebrate the arts, artists, and cultural traditions of the world. We look to the doing that every day and hope that we can do that on those moments throughout the day that we broadcast. With you as our partner, we will continue to celebrate Missoula and Montana and help curate to enhance our lives here. You know, we, we celebrate all that you do in Missoula to make it so fabulous. In this day and age, I would like to say, and I think we all in this room would agree, the arts are more important than ever. It's more important than ever to cultivate authentic moments of beauty, to look for those moments where we can connect as humans, and to uh, look for the common ground that, that art and culture creates for us. I'm happy to announce that starting this week, we now have a two-week online archive of all of our music shows. So in case you missed the free forums today, it's online for a couple of weeks, or the kids' show for your family on the weekend. Thanks for listening. Thanks for your support of MTPR. Spring Pledge Week is coming up April 7th. From pies to raft trips and goat manure, we have it all. All the important things like, will the cats take back the title this year? Call 1-800-325-1565 or 243-4931. I'm just practicing. I'd like to end by giving out the first annual MTPR Time Post Award to Tom Benson. <laughs> that, um, Time Post is radio lingo for being exactly on time. We have the atomic clock in the control room. We have to hit the network exactly. And if we don't talk too much, he always seems to end this thing exactly at 1 o'clock. Good luck, Tom. No pressure. Thanks so much. <laughs> Okay, here we go. <laughs> the Cultural Vision Award is given to a person or organization that has developed a special project or program demonstrating unique artistic vision. And this year, we honor Charlene Campbell Carey, nominated by Nancy Matthews. This story begins with Charlene's mother, Elizabeth Gillette, who danced at Radio City Music Hall at Rockefeller Center for 13 years. Charlene grew up in a world of dance, Trained, at the dance scholarship, trained on a dance scholarship throughout high school at the National Academy of Arts and later at the American Ballet Theater, where she was on the faculty. Charlene came, became choreographer for Chicago's Light Opera Works and served for the, on the faculty for the Lou Conte and Hubbard Street Dance Company for seven years. Before moving to Missoula, she was a leading dancer or choreographer for many ballets, operas, night club acts, and many special events, including the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, the Los Angeles Japan America Conference with Ronald Reagan, a Beverly Hills Christmas show with Whoopi Goldberg, an episode of Murder, She Wrote, how about that, and a choreographed the film Desire, which premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 1988. In 1998, she moved to Missoula and founded the Rocky Mountain Ballet Theater, and since then it has 50 original ballets in its repertoire and began touring internationally in 2002, representing the U.S. at a summer festival in Vienna. In 2008, prior to the Olympic Games, Charlene led the RMBT delegation to Beijing and other cities in China, including Guilin, which is in Montana's sister state of Guangxi, Yangshu, Shanghai, and Shuzhou. This tour led to an immediate invitation for a return trip to China to participate in the Beijing Dance Academy International Ballet Competition. The theater began a tradition of offering performances in Montana for former Senator Max Baucus and visiting ambassadors and diplomats from China, Peru, Vietnam, Colombia, Morocco, Panama, Chile, South Korea, Australia, Tajikistan, the Russian Federation, Japan, New Zealand, Bahrain, to name a few. For all this international focus, Charlene has created ballets with topics relevant to Montana, 
including the Going Viral series that included film backdrops and scientists from the Level 4 lab in Hamilton to showcase and inform the community about the facts of Ebola, polio, HPV in West Nile, and influenza. In addition, there were dance projects such as the Montana Wild Turkey, a cowboy roping dance, cowgirl kick line, and the inclusion of Native American dancers in performances. This past Christmas season, dancers performed a new ballet, the Engelman Spruce, in Washington, D.C., to help commemorate the Capitol Christmas tree from the Kootenai National Forest. In 2014, RMBT performed at the Salzburg Music Festival in collaboration with the Salzburg Ballet in Austria. In Austria. As a result, the company was invited to host the USA auditions for the Vienna International Ballet Experience, or VIBE. VIBE brought dancers, teachers, judges, and ancillary programs to, and audiences to Missoula as it continued to grow in scope. The original VIBE morphed into Missoula's own Ballet Beyond Borders this past January. The four-day event focused on dance of all kinds and includes dancers from several countries and genres and involves competitions, challenges, collaborations with such organizations as the Missoula Writing Collaborative, the Roxy Theater Film Series, the Mansfield Center, which co-hosted the Art of Diplomacy. Um, Charlene brought Patrick, Patricia Ward Kelly, or Mrs. Jean Kelly, to Missoula to speak at the Wilma Theater. And there was a culmination in a sold-out show at the Denison Theater on the final night. According to Nancy Matthews, Charlene has been able to bring Missoula a new awareness and ability of dance and the arts in general to communicate across borders, as well as a reinforced recognition of Montana's place in the culture of the American West. Moving to Montana and starting a ballet company, touring all over the world, performing for world ambassadors, developing a repertoire specific to Montana and its indigenous people, and finally, creating an international event in Missoula full of dance, competition, and cultural diplomacy in January. <laughs> that takes a lot of vision. Charlene Campbell Carey. Um, thank you. Thank you very, very much for this recognition. Um, I never plan speeches because as a choreographer, everything's always in process and um, that's the way my life has been here for the last 20 years. So to just say a few things that Tom didn't, um, and a few of you brushed upon James Lee Burke did on his family, I don't think cultural vision just becomes. You, there were a lot of seeds planted in, into my life as a child and as an adult. You, uh, Tom mentioned my parents, but my, my father was an artist as well. And I was well over 30 before I realized that most children didn't spend every waking hour of their life in an art museum or at a concert or at the ballet or flamenco. And every moment of my life was filled with art from my, from my parents. So naturally, um, those seeds were planted very young. And uh, I am a Chicago baby. I was an only child. And my life at 21, I was working in New York at American Ballet Theater in Radio City, and my father passed away suddenly on Memorial Day. So I flew home to be with my mother, and I wound up going to Hubbard Street Dance Company for class the next week. Mr. Baruchnikov was taking over American Ballet Theater, and we were, a lot of us were thinking of new places to go. And Hubbard Street offered me a job right off the bat. And Lou Conti was the director. Um, we became fast friends. And he had received a letter from a woman named Jan Snow in Missoula, Montana. And she had written this nice letter in 1981. This is way before 1998, Tom. Um, if he had some old school jazz teacher he could send that would be you know, indicative of Hubbard Street and um, for a workshop. Well, I apparently was the only one that thought that was the greatest invitation of all time. And I thought I was going to Africa. I mean, I, mean, I was a girl from New York, Chicago, and LA. I, had, I, I was sure I was the adventurous of all adventures. And in my jazz class, Elanita Brown was in my class. Some of you might remember that name very well. So I'm teaching my jazz class and wondering who this woman is who immediately invited me to her ranch after class. That's why I live in Montana. 
Ellen Ita and her husband, Joseph Epps Brown, introduced me immediately, not just to the arts and culture and the alpine beauty, but to something so unique, so tender that I was exposed to and, and I felt with my parents' roots as well. But here it was, the whole picture, the whole picture. So that was 1981. I went back to Chicago, then I moved on to Los Angeles. I wound up producing two films here in Montana, um, which are not something I speak about too often, but I did, and I spent time on the ranch. And when I moved here, I lived on the ranch, and I wound up living in Stevensville for the first 10 years of my time here in, in Montana. So there's, there's really no accidents with all of this. My mother, when I told her I loved Montana, was horrified, just did not want me to move here at all. She thought that was terrible. And then she told me she got pregnant in Montana. <laughs> and she was a ballerina, and I ended her career. So I, I didn't know that as a child, and, and it, was a, it was a big surprise to me. But what I'm saying is all the elements, when you say vision, I don't think there's, there's um, many accidents. And when I look around the room, and I recently had eye surgery, so I'm not looking that clearly, um, I've collaborated with most of you, or you've helped me raise money for an event, or you've, you've brought your children to study with us for the last 20 years. Um, and we're just getting started. And at my table, I mean, Juliet was another huge reason that I moved to Montana. So when I came here, we had 40 students. We were on Spruce Street. Larry Purney, my very first great collaborator, we created that ballet together called A Christmas Jewel, and we, we were painting those, he was painting in the barn in Stevensville on Elanita's ranch. So all I'm saying is there's so many layers before we went to China, and there's gonna be a lot of layers, I hope, for the next 20 years. Jennifer Kerber is one of our original 40 dancers, and she's you know, the staple and the backbone of what we do now, and Karen Carreno, my music director, moved here from Los Angeles, and we both started over here. So we're looking forward to the future. Ballet Beyond Borders is our future. Now we have thousands of children and academics and diplomats that we deal with happily every day, and we're looking forward to a new trip to China, to the Silk Road, we're looking forward to trips to Russia, and the children who have benefited from this locally, nationally, and internationally are gonna change our, our lives moving forward, and I see that every day with the kids from Brazil and Russia and Kazakhstan and, and Stevensville, Montana. So the last little um, trivia thing is, I met Don Carey the first time ever, 2003, at this event. And I'm Mrs. Donald Carey. Thank you so much. <laughs> Didn't quite make it to 1 o'clock, but almost there. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, and thanks again to our event sponsors, uh, Logjam Presents and First Security Bank. Um, I want to thank all of you for participating in the arts in some way. Uh, this is a great community to live in. Uh, I'm happy to be the director of Arts Missoula, and we'll look forward to seeing you all next year. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>